Welcome back to the Lars Larson Show. Pleasure to be with you. Glad to get your phone calls and emails. And boy, do we have a lot to talk to Frank Gaffney about. Frank, of course, is the founder and president of the Center for Security Policy. So, Frank, we have the departure of Ambassador Bolton as national security from the White House. And uh, the president wasn't exactly giving a pat on the back on the way out the door. We've got an explosion near the U.S. Embassy in Kabul, Afghanistan, and we have the failed talks uh, I guess they're failed. Uh, the plan for talks with the Taliban, we weren't even sure they were actually going to show up at Clamp, Camp David, but that got called off. Um, uh, uh, let's start, first of all, with the departure of Ambassador Bolton. I'm a fan of Ambassador Bolton, but I'm also a fan of Donald Trump. What should we make of the fact that the president says in a dismissive way, um, we no longer need the services of John Bolton? Well, John famously used to say, when he was national security advisor to the president, we're all one tweet away from dismissal. <laughs> and his his uh, his turn came. Uh, look, I I think that what I'd like to view that statement from the president as really saying is, your services are needed outside the government in support of my administration, and I think that what John Bolton will become once again. I mean, he he certainly was before he was tapped by the president, is one of the most effective surrogates and champions of this president in the country. Uh, And having credentialed him as his national security advisor, uh, even if uh, it ended uh, a little less happily than one might like, he, I think, has um, equipped John to be even more formidable in a role that in this next 14 months – frankly, might be even more important than that of the National Security Advisor. Frank, tell me this. When the president says, and he's being a a bit uh, opaque, when he says, I disagreed with many of his suggestions for what the administration should do, what do you think the president was thinking of specifically in that case? I don't think the president's going to say, but but it— you know, was he disagreeing? You know, did Bolton disagree with the, uh, you know, the overtures to North Korea with the I don't think he disagreed with the president on Iran. Um, so where where do you think those disagreements most likely popped up between the president and Ambassador Bolton? Oh, I suspect uh, them both being very um, strong willed, strong minded uh, individuals that they probably clashed on a lot of things. Um, but one of the things that I, I believe was always um, of surpassing importance, and it hasn't always been the case, but John Bolton knew who was boss. And in the end, it was always the president who made the call. And John Bolton was there to faithfully execute his direction. And uh, when you see this happening, um, it's it's something of an anomaly, <laughs> frankly, in official Washington, as I think you know, Lars, is a close student of these things. Uh, it's often the case that subordinates are sure they know better than the boss what uh, uh, what needs to be done. And uh, and especially in this administration, um, the place is just riddled with people who are constantly sabotaging the direction of the commander in chief. So yep. this this was an important um, attribute of John. And, and I think it made whatever disagreements they could have had and did on certain policy issues uh, relatively inconsequential. Well, and see, that's the thing. An awful lot of official Washington, I, I, I've told my wife, and I've told friends, uh, nobody ever gets fired in D.C. It's so-and-so has decided to leave. And, and you know, we all know you do get fired. In this case, the president made it clear because he said, I told the, you know, I told John Bolton I wanted his resignation on my desk the next morning. In some ways, I kind of like that kind of honesty, although I don't like the result for Bolton. But I think you're right. He will be a, a strong advocate on the outside. And frankly, I, I can't really imagine what it would be like to be president. But if you were president, you could sort of try to imagine that you're you're going to be asked to make some really huge decisions. And having people like Bolton who are unafraid to tell you, Mr. President, that's the wrong way to go, is is good advice even if you reject the – even if yeah, at the end of the day you say, no, I'm not going to take your advice. Okay, but at least you got that. Having a bunch of yes people around you uh, who just simply say, as I think they did during Obama, he had a lot of people around him who to- who told interviewers he was always the smartest guy in the room and he knew it. 
And so, uh, you know, can you imagine a person like that assembling a team that would actually tell him, Mr. President, I think you're wrong to go at it this way. But, you know, here are the consequences if you decide to go that direction. That's valuable for a commander in chief, the commander of a Navy ship, the commander of a military unit to have an executive officer who says, hey, that's not a good idea. And if you do it that way, it may not work out well. And here's why. And then you can listen to that advice and then make the decision you have to make. Yeah. I, again, at the risk of repeating myself, Lars, I, I think the problem of yes men surrounding somebody with the kind of power that the president of the United States has is is a very problematic deal for sure. But in a way, even worse is people who will say yes, Mr. President, and then go and sabotage his direction. And that was H.R. McMaster, I, wasn't it? Well, it was. Uh, and The, the I, guy who preceded alone, Bolton, frankly, for everybody who hasn't his, been keeping a scorecard on this. Second national security advisor after the short-lived Mike Flynn. But here's the point that, you know, the president has gotten amazing things done. I think it's indisputable. There, there are critics of it, obviously, but I think it is indisputable. He's gotten an amazing amount of things done, including in the national security space, thanks in no small measure of late to John Bolton and his service. But think about what this president could have accomplished if he weren't being sabotaged at every turn. And I don't just mean by the, you know, the Russia hoax conspiracy. I'm talking about in countless other ways um, that the deep state has been trying to ensure that whatever direction he has provided, uh, it is not going to be um, you know, actually conducted as the president has directed. And, and, and may I just say, I, I think that this is a kind of problem that when you look at it, um, one of the most important of these examples that I would just give you and your listeners, Lars, we've talked about it many times over the year. I am frantic about the fact that the country is so vulnerable to someone who knows what they're doing taking down our electric grid. And the most efficient way of doing that is through something called electromagnetic pulse. Under John Bolton's leadership, President Trump in March issued an executive order saying this is a huge problem. We need to address it. Uh, The Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Defense, Department of Energy and others all have certain timelines they have to meet. And there's a fellow in the Department of Homeland Security by the name of Scott Bacchus who has been entrusted the responsibility of leading the effort in the department for the execution of this strategy. And this man has just made it absolutely clear, if you know what to look for, that he is determined to completely undermine the president's initiative. And that shouldn't be allowed to happen. No. I hope whoever replaces John Bolton will ensure that um, that is not going to be the case going forward. Give me your assessment of what happened when the, the Taliban talks didn't happen at Camp David. Well, I think that the president uh, confronted a hard reality that the Taliban has no interest in ending the Afghan war on terms other than their victory and our defeat. And they were going to continue to kill Americans and Afghans and allied personnel um, through whatever process of, uh, of some kind of withdrawal agreement we fashioned. And having those guys at camp David, for heaven's sakes, in the aftermath of the latest of these murderous attacks, well, there's been another one today, as you yep. noted, this this is uh, something that would not be tolerable. And I think the president has, to his great credit, changed course. He has said the talks are dead, and we've recommended what we call a secure Afghanistan strategy. It's very briefly outlined at our website, securefreedom.org. I commend it to your listeners as an alternative to either continuing doing what we've been doing, which is untenable yep. and impracticable and unsustainable, or surrendering to these jihadists of the Taliban or ISIS or Al-Qaeda or the whole lot of them. Check it out at the Center for Security Policy.